Hey guys, uh, this is just a recording to replace um, the lecture that I'm going to miss on Tuesday the 30th. Uh, it seems I've come down with with a bit of a cold, so I'm going to release this on the website. All the homeworks do at the normal schedule, so um, on Wednesday's class I'll be collecting the homework from 2-3, 2-4, and then from today's lecture 2-5. Uh, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, so today's section is 2.5. Um, that section is all about problem solving. In particular, it's uh, it's about solving application problems or word problems as you might know them. Um, so on page 112, there is a five-step process for solving problems. Um, you don't have to go by this, but it's a good you know it's a good template if you're not used to doing this kind of stuff. Um, I don't personally like to use this, but that's probably just because I've been doing this for um, a little bit of time, so I don't have to. I don't like to stop and think about steps. I kind of just get in there and do it. But um, if you're having trouble solving application problems, maybe just keep this next to you um, while you do them, and remember to go through all these steps. All right. <clears throat> So also on page 113, um, as you see on the five steps of problem solving, the first step is to familiarize yourself with a problem. Um, on page 113, there are in-depth uh, in directions on how to do that, what that looks like. All right, without further delay, let's go ahead and get into it. So our first word problem, is all about hiking. Um, so this word problem says, in 1957, at the age of 69, Emma Grandma Gatewood became the first woman to hike solo all 2,100 miles of the Appalachian Trail from Springer Mountain, Georgia, to Mount Katahdin, Maine, Gatewood repeated the feat in 1960 and again in 1963. Becoming the first person to hike through blah, 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 blah. At that point, <laughs> at that point, how far was she from the end of the trail? <laughs> okay, um, so looks like we have a couple important things. She was three times as far from the northern end as from the southern end. Okay, so out of all that stuff that they gave us, there was really only a few pieces of information that were important. All the rest, if you uh, read it a little more closely, you'll see that it's just background. Um, I don't think it really has anything to do with the problem at hand. Um, basically, so we have a distance, right? The distance of the trail, the distance, and we'll be using the, um, the, the classic, Actually, maybe we won't. Um, okay, so for this one, we see that the uh, total distance of the trail was 2,100 miles. And then it gives us sort of uh, her relationship to those 2,100 miles in this sentence I've highlighted in blue. Uh, so it says 2,100 miles. She was three times as far from the northern end of the trail as from the southern end. Okay. <clears throat> So let's go ahead and draw a diagram. When it comes to distance and physical problems like this, a diagram is always the best thing to do. Um, so let's say this is the start. This is the finish. Um, the sentence highlighted in blue says, she was three times as far from the northern end of the trail as from the southern end. Hmm, which one's the finish? Ah, the northern. Hmm. Let's take a look at this real quick. Okay, so they're, they're saying the southern end is the finish. <clears throat> okay, so they're saying that the distance right here is equal to three times some number, and that number is the distance here. So we have x and then 3x. Uh, the total amount, right, if we talk about the total amount of distance, this whole thing, well, this is all equal to 2,100 miles. All right, so if we kind of put this all together, it's saying that 
uh, this leg, this distance, plus this distance is going to equal this distance. So we have 3x plus x equals 2100. All right, if we combine our like terms, that gives us 4x equals 2100. And I have x equals 525. Okay, so she was 525 miles from the finish. So if I were going to complete this problem, um, <clears throat> you know, if I were on an exam, I would say um, at, at the point, um, I don't know, the point referenced, um, Gatewood was 525 miles from the southern end of the trail and three times that from the northern end of the trail. <laughs> Sorry, I wouldn't write all that in an exam. You know, I'd, I'd try and find a way to put it uh, <laughs> efficiently. So anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about a consecutive number problem. Um, and I, before I go too far into this, let's just kind of go into what I'm going to do here in this lesson. So um, we're going to go over several sort of application types and each type is associated with a formula or a concept that helps you solve that application type. Uh, and so I can't say that all of the applications types are sort of included here, but these are the most common ones. And so the last one we did was a bit like a total value problem where we add up two values and, and uh, match it to a total value. Um, this next one, this is called a consecutive numbers problem. Uh, the one that we do after this is a total cost problem. Then we'll do a perimeter problem. Then we'll do a angles of a triangle problem. Um, so you see what I'm getting at. I'm going over the general types here. Uh, if you sort of write down these general types and practice them, uh, then you should be okay for this next exam. <coughs> so. Let's go ahead and start on the consecutive number problems. So for consecutive number problems, uh, the general formula or the general idea is basically that we can represent two consecutive numbers as x and x plus 1. We can say let one, can, let one number equal x, then the consecutive, then the next consecutive number in line as x plus 1. If we're talking about two consecutive odd integers, then we're talking about x and x plus 2, right? Suppose x were 3, then x plus 2 would be 5. That's two odd integers. Um, and the same, the same concept goes for even integers as well. So we use x and x plus 2 for, for two even integers. Let's go ahead and do a problem that uh, has to do with these consecutive numbers. So US interstate, highways, post, numbered markers, highways post numbered markers at every mile to indicate the location um, to indicate location in case of an emergency the sum of two consecutive mile markers on I-70 in Kansas is is means equals 559 find the numbers on the markers so we're gonna say let n Let n represent a number. Then we can say that n plus the next consecutive number in the line, which is n plus 1, is equal to 559. Okay, so the next thing I do is collect like terms. I notice that these parentheses don't really matter because there's a plus sign in front of them, so those can go away. And I have n plus n plus 1 equals 559. Five, Oops, 559. Five, that means that I have 2n plus 1 equaling 559. Five, now I'm going to use my additive opposites on both sides to get rid of this 1 because I want to isolate that 2n. So I'm going to say minus 1, minus 1, and I have 2n equals 559. Five, Sorry, 558 five, now. 558. Five, <clears throat> if I divide both sides by 2, because that's the coefficient on my variable up here, so I can divide both sides by 2, that's going to cancel, and I'm going to get n equals 558 five, over 2, which is 279. 279. 
Okay, so the numbers are, if n is 279, then the next one is uh, 380. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, 380, 280, excuse me. <laughs> now let me punch that into my calculator and make sure that it works. 279 plus 280, that is in fact equal to 559. So uh, I have the correct answer here. <clears throat> uh, and as you can see from my setup, and, uh-oh, uh-oh, sorry about that, n plus n plus 1, equals 559, five, right? This is how how we should look at this. N was 279, N plus 1 was 280. And that's how consecutive number problems work. Uh, if they said two consecutive odd integers, suppose they said two consecutive even integers equaled um, 488, I don't even know if there are two consecutive integers that do this. Sorry, two consecutive even integers that do this. Um, but we would represent that as n and n plus 2, right? If we said there were two consecutive evens or two consecutive odds. All right, so that's how you do a consecutive numbers problem. The next kind of problem we're going to talk about is a total cost problem. Uh, so the general formula for this one, although it does, this one's a little bit more um, fluid than some of the other ones. And so the general formula kind of switches around sometimes in this one. But in general, we have the base cost for some item or some service usually. Uh, as in like base cost, like they start out at $100 a day, and then we have the cost per unit times units. And so a typical setup would be like, um, oh, I don't know. Let's say, uh, you know, your kid's birthday had like pony rides or something like that. And so the base cost was like $500 to get the pony there. And then it costs you an extra five bucks per ride per kid after that or something. So that's kind of like the makeup of these total cost problems. Let's go ahead and do an example from the book. So we have photography. Um, we have this, this lady named Marissa. She has a budget of $500 for photographs for her company's website. Uh, some of her friends have recommended fine taste photography. Fine taste photography. That is a lame name. Um, <laughs> so Marissa has learned that fine taste charges $125 for a day session plus a fee for each image used. From her friends, she has gathered the following data. From the information given, how many images can Marissa buy without exceeding her budget? Okay. So let's go up to our general form. Oops. So we need a base cost, cost per unit, and the number of units, a total cost. Those are That's all the information that we're looking for. Um, so she has a budget of 500. We know that's going to come into play. Um, fine taste, the photography place charges 125 for a day session plus a fee used, so we know base cost now. Base cost is equal to $125. And they have a fee for each image used. Uh, let's figure out what that fee is. So we can figure out that fee with this table, and this is just like that problem where we uh, we we always divide sort of the final cost by the total number of images or actions or items or whatever. So we're going to start out with 65 divided by 2. That's 32.5. Then we're going to say, we're going to say, well, let's make sure that this doesn't change as we, as the number rises. So we have 650 divided by 20. 32.5. One more time, just to make sure that nothing funky is going on here, we're going to divide this last row, 780 by 24. 780 divided by 24. Okay, all of these give us a 32.5 per image cost. So, cost per unit For this example, it's 32 
0.5. That is, those are expensive pictures right there. Those better be, those better be some fine taste pictures. <clears throat> okay, so now um, the other information we we want, right? We're, as we're using our little template up here, we have base cost, we have cost per unit, um, x. That's the number of pictures she's going to take, right? Well, they don't give us a number because that's what they're wondering about. So, uh, oops. Number of picks, we're going to say that's equal to X. And then the total cost. It does say that she has a budget of $500. So what we're looking for is the number of pictures that are, are going to be used up by that $500 budget. So that's the total cost. The total equals 500. All right, and so we're going to set up this equation just like the general guy is set up up here. So we have our base cost, that's 125 plus cost per unit, which is 32.5 times the number of units, which is X number of pictures, and that's equal to the total cost, 500. All right, all we need to do is solve for X now. So remember, when I'm solving for X, I eventually want something that looks like this. X equals my solution, right? So I need to isolate X. I need to get this guy all alone. So I'm going to subtract everything else over the other side. I'm going to add the opposite of everything else over the other side. The opposite of 125 is negative 125. So I'm going to subtract 125 from both sides. Uh, the left side goes to zero, and I have 32.5x equals 500 minus 125, which is 375. Okay, now, now I have a coefficient attached to my variable through multiplication. That means that I need to divide both sides by that coefficient in order to isolate the variable. 32.5 whoops, 32.5, boom. Now I have x equals 375 over 32.5. And I'm gonna go ahead, you guys should go ahead and do the longhand division on that. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Put it in your calculators, folks. Okay, so that's gonna end up being roughly, whoops, it's definitely an ugly number. So I'm gonna say roughly on this, roughly 11.5. Five, three. <clears throat> uh oh, my battery is running low. I thought I had this plugged in. Okay, so um, as we said, our answer was, our initial answer was 11.54. Sorry, I rounded incorrectly. Um, but that's not quite our final answer, right? What did they want to know? They wanted to know how many images can Marissa buy without exceeding her budget? So she can't buy 11.54 images. I mean, who wants half an image? That doesn't really make any sense. So our final answer in this is actually a little bit different than our final answer to the equation. All right? we can say, Marissa can buy, at most, you don't actually have to say at most, though. I would just accept the answer. Can buy 11 images. Right? We have to round down because she doesn't, her budget's 500. We don't want to go over her budget. We have to stay under her budget. And so with 11 images, she's going to have just a little bit money uh, out of her budget left over, you know, to buy some frames for those pictures or something like that. So, that's the final answer. And remember, just be careful in these, these, these application problems. Um, you know, if you reach this final result, 11.54, I, you know, I probably couldn't give you full credit for that without saying this last part, Marissa can buy at most 11 images or Marissa can buy 11 images. Um, just because, you know, 11.54, that's not quite what the question was asking for. So be careful in these application problems, make sure you're answering the question they ask, not just solving the equation you came up with. <clears throat> All right. So that was our example of a total value problem. Remember, sometimes this general formula 
is a little bit different, but for the most part, it's correct. Um, there's not a whole lot of examples I can think of that are different. All right, so let's tackle a perimeter problem. <clears throat> <clears throat> perimeter problems, at least when they have a rectangular perimeter, always have this general equation, P equals 2W plus 2L. That means perimeter in our rectangular perimeter. Um, let's say this is W, this is L. The perimeter, meaning the distance around the edges, is equal to two times the width and two time, plus two times the length. If it's not a rectangular uh, perimeter, if it's like triangular or anything like that, you just need to add all the edges up. Um, but perimeter is sort of one of the more standard ones. So let's go ahead and do an example. So suppose we have an NBA court, um, and the perimeter of that is 288. So right off the bat, I can say, well, I know that P is equal to 288. Um, the length is 44 feet longer than the width. Okay, so they've given me the other two values, W and L, in a relationship to each other. Um, so they've said the length, L, is equals length is... 44 feet longer, 44 plus the width, W. Okay. <clears throat> so, now they've given us basically everything we need to go ahead and fill this problem in. So the problem is P perimeter equals 2W plus 2L. Um, we have a value for P, we have a value for L, uh, and we don't really, I guess in quotation marks, have a value for W, but we can solve for W. Here's how we do it. So for perimeter, P, we just enter in the number we have, 288. This is equal to 2 times W. We don't really have a value for W, so we just enter in W, 2W. And then we have 2L. Here's the trick, right? We know what L is equal to in terms of W. It's this guy, so we're going to sub that in. And that way we have an equation with only W's, and we can solve for W. So 2 times L, that is 2 times 44 plus W. All right, and so now we have an equation without L's. We can solve for W and then use that value of W to solve for L. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and do that. So I have 288, that stays the same. 2w, that stays the same. I have to get rid of these parentheses, so I'm going to distribute. So I have 2 into 44, that gives me 88. I have 2 into w, that gives me 2w. All right, now I'm going to collect all my like terms. I have 288 equals 2w and 2w, that equals 4w plus 88. All right, now I want to isolate that 4w, so I'm going to subtract the 88 from both sides. Minus 88, minus 88, that gives me 200 equaling 4w. Now, the w has a 4 as a coefficient, so to isolate that w, I divide both sides by the coefficient. Divided by 4, divided by 4, and I'm going to have w equals 50. All right, so if my width equals 50, what does my length equal? Well, I'm going to use this, this L equals W plus 44 to figure that out. So L equals W plus 44. That is equal to 50 plus 44, which is equal to 94. So W equals 50, L equals 94. And since this is... Um, <clears throat> Since this is an application problem, let's go ahead and put it in a sentence, even though sometimes I forget to do that. So we would say the... Oh, I'm having a malfunction problem with my battery today. Hopefully this can resolve itself. Just a moment. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Battery problems. Hopefully I can keep this going until I'm done recording here and done the uploading. <laughs> Um, so, as I was about to say, the
the perimeter of has, sorry, I'm a bit distracted here, has um, a width of 50 and and a length of 94. All right, so that is how you handle the basic perimeter problem. Let's go on to triangles. So one of the many general formulas we deal with with triangles, um, and in this class, I guess we'll be dealing with maybe two general formulas. Um, one of them is that all three angles of a triangle add to 180 degrees. It doesn't really matter what triangle it is. This is one of the fundamental properties of all triangles. So acute, um, obtuse, right triangles, all of them, their angles add to 180. Later on, we'll use Pythagorean theorem and area formulas and all that. But at this stage, we're just talking about the sum of the angles. So for this next problem, uh, we have a triangular gable end of a roof. The angle at the peak is twice as large as the angle on the back side of the house. Okay, so we have a triangular gable end roof, and it's on a little... A little house. I don't know why I'm choosing now to work on my artistic abilities, but as you guys can see, I'm quite the the master. <laughs> this is what happens when I when I teach class from home. All right. Anyway, so um, we have the uh, the the house here. Um, we have the triangular roof, and it says the peak is twice as large as the angle on the back side of the house. So twice as large as the angle on the back side. So let's just name the angle on the back side X. That means the angle on the, the peak is 2X. And obviously this isn't this drawing is not to scale. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we have two of our angles measured, and then it says the measure on the angle of the front side is 20 degrees greater than the angle on the back side. Okay, so the angle on the back side is x, so that means this is x plus 20. All right. Now, we know that our total is 180, and we know that all these angles have to add up to that, so we just do that. x plus 2x plus x plus 20 equals 180. Right, and so all I did was I took my angles and I plugged them into a sum for this equation. All right, so now I'm going to collect like terms. I have x, 2x, and x. 2 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4. And I have 4x plus 20 is equal to 180. Now I'm going to subtract 20 from both sides because I want to get my 4x alone. Boom. Now I have 4x is equal to 180 minus 20, that's 160, which tells me that x is equal to 40 degrees. All right, what did the original problem want? How large are the angles? So to complete this problem, we would say, The angles of the roof are 40 degrees for the back angle, right? The upper angle was 2x, so we have 80 degrees. And then the front angle was x plus 20, so that's 40 plus 20, that's 60 degrees. Do these, in fact, add up to 180? Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm completely correct, but that does mean I'm at least um, correct about my own equation. Oops, I, I guess I should have put an and in here, if I'm being grammatically proper. Okay, so that's it for triangle problems, at least in this chapter. It's all going to be about the angles, adding them up to 180. Eventually, they're going to have some different things going on. But for now, that's about it. <clears throat> 
All right, so let's talk about motion. Um, these ones are really common, the motion problem. The general formula is D equals RT, or some people might know it as D equals ST, right? Um, so just remember, both of these are equal to speed or rate. It's the exact same thing. Uh, these are interchangeable equations, right? It just depends on how you like to write it. How do you like to represent rate or speed? I typically use speed. I don't know why. And actually, it's kind of a foolish thing to do because my S's look a lot like fives. So maybe I'll switch to R's. <clears throat> so anyway, this is the official formula in your book. Um, <clears throat> Let's go ahead and do a D equals RT problem. So we have Sharon. Uh, she drove for three hours on a highway and then for one hour on a side road. Okay, her speed on the highway. And so hold on, let's just stop right now. Uh, Sharon drove for three hours on a highway, then for one hour on a side road. So let's just say Total time equals four. I don't know if we'll be using that, but I'm going to write it down. Her speed on the highway was 20 miles per hour faster than her speed on the side road. And you know what? Now that I'm seeing what this is breaking down to, which is the case with most motion formulas, we're going to create a table for this. And this is going to help us to sort of organize our equations. So before we get any further, let's make a table. All right, across the top of the table, we typically write our general formula, D, S, and T. I should say we typically write the variables of our general formula. We're going to put two rows on the side, one for each leg of her journey. She drove three hours on highway, H, W, Y, and then for one hour on a side road, S, R. I don't know why I put the R there, or the, the one there. So now we have our table. Now we fill out as many of these boxes as we can, and that should help us to find out exactly what's going on. So um, first off, the first sentence says, Sharon drove three hours on highway and then one hour on side road. That's our time column. So on the highway, we have three hours. On the side road, we have one. Um, so for the speed, it says that her speed on the highway was 20 miles per hour faster than her speed on the side road. So let's just label the side road X and the speed on the highway X plus 20. Right? That's our relationship there between the two. Um, <clears throat> so it says she traveled a total of 220 miles. How fast did she travel? on the side road. So this is a specific kind of distance problem that is, um, it's like a total, hmm, I would say this is like a total motion problem I would call it, and so this is like when two things add up to a total. Uh, so sometimes it's total distance, sometimes it's total time, and that's why I isolated this total time earlier because I thought that might be the case, but it's not. It's a total distance, um, you know, and, and when they isolate some total value like that, then it's one of these types of problems. There's another type of motion problem um, that we'll show you later on. So the total time, sorry, not the total time, I'll erase that so I don't get distracted. Um, the total distance of the problem, that is something they give us, which is 220. So I'm not going to really write anything in these columns, right? Because they don't really split it, split it up. What we can write <clears throat> is uh, that we know the total distance, and we also know speed times time, sorry, rate times time equals distance. So we know the distance from both of these legs, at least in a formula. Right, and so highway, highway distance is equal to speed times time, which is x plus 20 times 3. Side road distance, that's equal to 
x times one hour, which is one. And we know their total distance. So we can say highway distance plus side road distance is equal to total distance. Okay, so uh, our highway distance, we have it up here. We just translate it downwards. So 3 times x plus 20. That's our highway distance. We add that to our side road distance. That's x times 1, which is just x. And then that equals our total distance. They gave that to us in the problem. It says she traveled a total of 220 miles. 220. And now we have our equation that we can solve. Okay, let's go about solving that. Uh, so first, we need to unlock everything from the parentheses, which means we need to do our distribution. So we have 3 times x, that's 3x, 3 times 20, plus 3, uh, sorry, plus 60, not plus 20. I'm going too fast for my own good. This is what I get. Uh, 3 times 20, <clears throat> plus the x that was hanging out over there, and that still equals the total of 220. Okay. <clears throat> if what I'm doing up here with these equations is not making too much sense to you right now, we're past the point where you need to know this kind of stuff, so you got to go and practice this, right? Go do some odd problems from, um, I believe it was section 2. Point... Yeah, section 2.2 .2 shows us how to solve equations while using both principles. So if any of this, if you're uncomfortable with any of this, go do a bunch of odd problems from section 2.2 .2 just to practice them. And if you're still uncomfortable with them, come and see me. All right, so let's keep on solving this guy. So at this step, we should be collecting our like terms. I have 3x and I have x. That gives me a 4x. The 60 is a constant, so I can't add it. And that's equal to 220. Now I want to isolate this 4x, which means that I have to subtract the opposite of whatever it's attached to. So I say minus 60 on both sides. And I have 4x equals... 220 minus 60, which is 160. All right. Now, I divide both sides by the coefficient that's attached to my variable. The coefficient is 4 in this example. Cancel that out, and I say x equals 40. All right. So what was the original problem? They want to know how fast did she travel on the side road? So let's go ahead and write our sentence. And actually, let's check to make sure that we, that we defined x correctly and we don't have to do any extra work, right? So x equals 40. We defined x as Sharon's speed on, on the side road. So yeah, we defined it correctly, uh, which means we can just put it directly into a sentence. But if they were asking for her highway speed, and we happen to name the highway speed x plus 20, then we'd have to add 20 to our final answer. Since it's asking about the side road speed, we don't have to do anything. So Sharon traveled at, at a speed of 40 miles per hour on the side road. There we go. All right, so the last kind of problem that we're going to go over today are percent increase and percent decrease problems. Uh, these, are, these are ones that have a ton of real world applications. Um, so let's just go ahead and launch into them. <clears throat> so when it comes to percent increase or percent decrease problems, we have three very important numbers that we want to identify at the beginning of each, each problem. The original price, the percent, the price changed, positive or negative, and the new price. All three of those is what we want to pick out, and we can just enter them into this general formula down here. Solve for the variable and call it a day. <clears throat> All right, so, so basically, uh, I've went, I went ahead and drew out the general formula for you guys. It's the original percent, 
sorry, the original price plus whatever percent change times that price equals the new price. Sometimes the percent change is negative. Just remember to keep that sign in there. So if it's negative 20%, that should be a negative C in this equation. Okay, so um, example number seven on page 20. We're gonna do that for an example. Um, so basically this example says, through diet and exercise, Gabrielle's weight decreased from 150 pounds to 145 pounds. What was the percent decrease in her body weight? Okay, so let's just write down real quick. All right, so, so what this question says is that this lady's weight decreased from 150 to 145, and it's asking what is the percent of the decrease? Um, whoops. Uh-oh. We're having lots of problems today. So let's go ahead and pick our three important numbers out of this problem. Remember, our three important numbers are the original price, the percent change, and the new price. All right, so the original price, sorry, the original weight in this case, um, it says she went from 150, so this is 150, uh, the percent change, The percent change, it doesn't tell us that, but it asks us what the percent was. So we're gonna name that X, the new, right? Her new weight, she went from 150 to 145. 145 is her new weight. So now I'm gonna go ahead and enter these in directly in the general formula. So we have P plus CP equals N. Price plus the percent change times the price equals the new. <laughs> and these are poorly named for this example. You know, in this example, it would be weight plus the percent change in weight times weight equals the new weight. Not like you guys care. All right, so let's go ahead and go here. So the price P, right, this is P, this is C, and this is N. So P is 150. C, that's equal to X, as we have it in this one. <laughs> This is weird. Uh, the P that's still equal to 150 times 150, and that is equal to the new, which is 145. All right, so now we have, now we've got our equation. Let's go ahead and solve it. 150 plus 150X equals 145. All right, so to get the X alone, I want to get this guy alone, so I'm going to have to get rid of this 150. So I'm going to add its opposite to both sides. Minus 150, minus 150. Boom, that goes away, and I have 150x is equal to negative 5. So now I'm going to divide both sides by 150. And I have x is equal to, oh, that's terrible right there. X is equal to five divided by 150. X is equal to, darn it, <laughs> negative 0 0.03 repeating, right? And so they wanna know what, what's that percentage, right? And so that percentage is, if we wanna turn this into percentage form, we just take our decimal right here and we move it two places to the right, boom, boom. So that gives us roughly three point three repeating percent, right? And so it's 3.3, .3. I actually, in this decimal form, I shouldn't have put this bar up here so we can see why it's 3.3. .3. So remember the bar means repeating, so this is 3.3.3, .3 blah, 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 uh, all the way to infinity. Um, and I can represent that with a bar over one of the threes. And that's why in percentage form, it's 3.3% and not just a three straight 3%. So what, what's this lady's name? Gabby. So we can say 
Gabby lost 3.3 repeating percent of her body weight. <clears throat> So that's it. Those are the types of word problems you're going to run into, uh, at least in this section. They'll change later. We'll introduce new ones. But for right now, those are the ones you're going to want to practice. Um, just because they seem easy now doesn't mean they'll always be easy. Remember to do a lot of odd problems just to check your work and make sure that you're doing these correctly. Right? If you're very uneasy about the way the motion problem worked, go do three or four of those. Uh, odd problems and make sure you got the correct answer. If you keep getting the wrong answer or if you're not sure how to do them still, come see me. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I hope you guys are doing better today than I am. Um, and I will see you guys in class tomorrow, Wednesday. And have a good day.